So we're on part 11 here of our uh, Thou Preparest a Table Before Me, uh, looking at wild wild edible plants. And uh, it's, been, uh, it's been fun to go through these um, myself and have included or increased the number of, of plant friends that I have where I live. And when I'm out and about, I notice more and more things that are beneficial in a variety of ways. Uh, challenge for me is I need to go back and review things again because uh, I find that uh, some of the things that, that I remember um, <clears throat> need to be refreshed on because there's so many different options. The beautiful thing is that with so many options, uh, you have multiple options for doing the same thing, which is very helpful. So many plants have similar, similar properties, uh, which that overlap is helpful. <clears throat> so just a reminder that uh, the, the information that we're sharing is uh, educational on purpose and any health challenge that you may be encountering a health health crisis uh, you want to have a, a, a care provider that is congruent, congruent thought process as far as the type of treatment you would like to work with um, and uh, just do any due diligence that you would need to before starting on any any uh, protocol or regimen <clears throat> So tonight, uh, our first plant is one that uh, we have growing on our property um, quite a bit, and you may too. It's called wild geranium, and it uh, uh, <clears throat> comes in a couple different uh, species, so geranium uh, carolinium and geranium uh, robertium. And it's also known as crane's bill, and in our area, it's known as stinky bob, um, simply because when you touch it, it has some glandular hairs on it. They have some scent characteristics. It smells very pungently of <clears throat> kind of the geranium family of, of smells. Now, the thing that I'm talking about tonight, in particular in conjunction with wild geranium, I don't know that the properties cross over to, to the um, <clears throat> cultivars, the, <clears throat> the horticultural varieties of, <clears throat> of geranium. So the leaves of the wild geranium can be eaten raw, uh, cooked, or in tea form. <clears throat> they're kind of astringent. They're kind of a, uh, a bitter taste to them. So they, they can be eaten fresh in kind of a salad, providing kind of a symphony of flavor, or they can be um, boiled and uh, the water thrown off and then restarted again. <clears throat> Not restarted, but just refreshed. The roots, they can be boiled. In fact, the roots are most sought after from a medicinal standpoint. Uh, they tend to soften up in about 10 minutes. <clears throat> and they're, then they're eaten. And the tea that was made to soften them is very helpful for upset stomach and other, um, other medicinal issues. The leaves themselves, the tannins in them, give them an astringent and bitter, astringent action, which is a con tissue contraction type of action. And they're bitter tasting. But uh, the young leaves, have less bitterness associated with them than the older leaves. As most things, most plants age, they tend to become a little bit more pronounced in their flavor. <clears throat> so you can change the water again once during cooking to reduce that bitterness. If you're making a tea, you can use some type of milk. I'm sure that uh, the source that I pulled this from was referring to dairy milk, but there's other types of milks out there, almond, soy, rice, or various bean milks, and they can cut the bitterness to uh, enjoy the tea. So it's a very common Pacific Northwest plant. It's a very geranium-like pungent odor to it, very delicate blossom, very lacy leaves, and it has a tendency to kind of uh, grow upward on spindly, spindly stems. So it has very high antioxidants present, and it actually accumulates the, the element geranium, hence its name and it promotes uh, oxygen transport in the skin. So that's helpful in a variety of medicinal levels. <clears throat> also has iron, potassium, calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, and then the three primary uh, vitamins, A, B, and C. So from a medicinal standpoint, has a tissue contracting ad, uh, action that has an is stringency. And these are the roots that you can see here. You see the blossom and then the stems are kind of hairy. And then the root is kind of a surface tap root. It doesn't go very deep. They actually pull up very easy. In fact, the stems are very fairly brittle and they often will break off above the roots <clears throat> very easily, and even more so than other tap root kind of plants. The leaves are used, but the roots are the primary medicinal part of the plant that is, is used. 
It functions to help stop bleeding and dry tissue. So that tissue contraction ag action helps to stop the bleeding. <clears throat> you can use the, the whole plant, the blossoms, the leaves, the stems, the root. So it hey, aids in the stopping of bleeding. <clears throat> so in that regard, it's uh, known as a, a styptic. So that is something that stops bleeding. So an astringent does an overall tissue contraction, which as a byproduct is uh, involved with stopping of bleeding. Uh, but a styptic is specifically something that is beneficial for stopping bleeding as such. So a poultice of the roots or leaves can be used on a moist wound to help dry them out and stop the bleeding. If you're gonna be using the, the, the roots or leaves for stopping bleeding, just clean the roots or leaves. You don't want the dirt on them. Apply it to the wound. Hold that compress tightly for several minutes or until the bleeding stops and bind that poultice on with a, a clean gauze or some type of wrap to hold it in place. So the roots or leaves can be used in salves to promote healing of the skin. And it does that primarily by increasing oxygen transport to the skin, circulation to the skin due to the uh, germanium uh, mineral that is present in it. So that aids oxygen transport in the skin areas. <clears throat> It's also helpful for stomach upset and diarrhea. The tea, just cook it, ten, the root 10 minutes, and then use the water to drink. So you're not gonna be using the root itself, but just the, the decoction essentially, the water extract. So remember an infusion is basically hot water, boiling water poil, poured over parts of the plant and left to steep before drinking. Whereas a decoction actually takes a longer boiling process rather than just a, a taper down in heat. So it's very beneficial for canker sores. I remember having canker sores semi-frequently as a kid. I don't know why exactly, but on your tongue or the inside of your mouth. But canker sores are helpful. You can use the root tea, again, like you made for the, for the previous uh, issue as a wash, or you can cover the uh, canker sore with a poultice of the, of the root, the crushed root. So crushing it helps to relieve or release some of the medicinal qualities of it. Again, because of that tissue contraction, astringent nature of it, it helps to reduce canker sores quickly. Canker sores can be quite painful and annoying, and you just kind of have to live with them. Sometimes eating, I would say maybe acidic fruit, too much of that, like maybe, I know that this is a little bit different, but eating too much pineapple can get the swords, uh, corners of your mouth, they can start to hurt, or maybe too much citrus can sometimes lead to a canker sore. Depends on the individual. So the sore throat, you can use the tea, again, that root tea. You can drink it. Uh, you can gargle it. Uh, you can use it as a poultice on the exterior if you're doing a, a compress around the neck with a rag and a, uh, a cold rag around the, <clears throat> the neck. It can help increase circulation to the skin and aid in the, the relieving of the symptoms and the causal agent of the sore throat. So <clears throat> it may have antiviral properties that, that uh, benefits you as well. So there's an article here in uh, BioWorg Med Chem, March 1, 2009, uh, by um, Emeril et al. <clears throat> and they looked at geranium, or ger the geranium, yes, um, plant extracts with anti-inflammatory properties, a new approach for characterization of their bioactive compounds, and establishment of structure antioxidant activity relationships. So there is research being done <clears throat> on geranium as well as other native plants as we begin to look more at their chemical properties. In fact, most medicine has as their original derivative, a plant source or animal source. And then it's gone and been synthesized in the lab, which is a patentable process. Typically natural products, natural things are not patentable. And so there isn't as much derived from a financial gain standpoint to promote their use. There's more derived to promote the use of a pharmaceutical because there is dollars attached to it. And we've seen that whole thing play out here in the recent uh, pandemic. <clears throat> so the hepatitis B, which is uh, essentially liver inflammation, itis is an inflammation, hepatic refers to the, to the liver. I remember growing up, we would see a plant called hepatica that was, or liverwort, uh, was down in some of the areas where we would go hiking with my parents. Uh, but uh, hepatitis, hepa, hepatic, refers to the liver, and itis is inflammation. So hepatitis B is a liver inflation that essentially comes from promiscuity and needle sharing of, uh, of um, drug sources. That's the common sources of transmission 
but it could conceivably very rarely transport other, other ways. <clears throat> so you can use a tincture of the geranium curlinium, and that contains geranulin or geranin and hyperin, which are compounds that are antagonistic to uh, hepatitis B. You can also use the fresh leaves, rub it on your skin to function as a skin or a, a, a repellent for insects if you're out in the, in the woods and don't have any other insect repellent available, it can work in that regard. Uh, when you're harvesting them, <clears throat> you wanna harvest the young leaves, use the, them fresh or dry them and store them. The roots you wanna dig in the late fall, they're gonna be more starchy and have uh, stored the energy in their, in their roots for the winter time. You can also dig them early in the spring in addition if needed. So clean those roots, slice them thinly and dry for future use where you can use them as fresh. So here's three different recipes for using the wild geranium. So we have a tea, a uh, tincture, and a root tea. So the first one is a leaf and stem tea, so the aerial parts, those that are above the ground. So two tablespoons of dried leaves and stems, two cups of boiling water, steep for 10 minutes or more, and then strain and, and drink the tea. So that tea can be used internally and externally as a wash. The root tea has higher qualities from a medicinal standpoint than the leaf tea. So the leaf tea is more mild. <clears throat> the, the root tea is more concentrated. So two cups of boiling water, again, two tablespoons of chopped fresh or dried root, and then reduce heat and simmer 10 to 15 minutes. So that's more like a decoction as opposed to an infusion. <clears throat> Remove it from the heat and steep it for 10 more minutes and you can use three cups per day of that tea. So again, the difference between a decoction and a tea or an infusion. <clears throat> the infusion uses the leaves and stems that are finely ground up or, or powdered, typically not powdered, but definitely fine, versus the more intact plant components like roots will be boiled in a decoction. So a wild geranium tincture. So a tincture is an extraction process that takes more time and get some more of the compounds that can be stored for a longer period of time. <clears throat> So use a sterilized glass jar. You can sterilize it just by sticking it in boiling water. That'll sterilize it and that hot jar will then dry out quickly. Just add three quarters of a jar of fresh chopped root or half a jar of dried root. So you would fill the jar with vegetable glycerin. So if you, if you most of these tincture extractions use 80 proof alcohol, you can also do the extra extractions with vegetable glycerin. <clears throat> and you don't have the alcohol to contend with. The glycerin tends to have a little bit shorter shelf life than the alcohol, but then it's not a preservative per se to the same extent that alcohol is. So just like to use the vegetable glycerin so we're avoiding alcohol use. <clears throat> Pack the jar with the herb and then add the glycerin. So you're filling it up and then affix the lid tightly. Store it in a cool, dark place. Shake it six, uh, daily for six to eight weeks. So just uh, take it out of the cupboard and, and shift it around, shake it back and forth and set it back in. Then once you get to the end of your, your period of time where you're doing your, your extraction, strain it, keep the fluid portion of it, label it and date it. And particularly for the alcohol base that can store up to 10 years before it, it needs to be replaced. Glycerin is gonna be a, a less amount of time that will be allowed to be stored just because it doesn't have quite the same preservative qualities as the alcohol does. Mm. Our next thing I like to look at trees too is looking at the birch tree, betula species. So birch comes in a lot of different varieties. There's the white birch. Uh, you can see three different varieties that are here. <clears throat> one with a very shaggy bark on it, one with more smooth bark. So the, the birch tree comes in lots of different manifestations, typically has white or light colored bark that peels off around the tree trunk. Most other trees other than cherry and birch, the bark, will uh, come off going up the tree, whereas birch and cherry peels off going around the tree. <clears throat> That's one way that you can tell the difference. So primarily used from an edibility standpoint is the sap. It can be used plain or made into a syrup by boiling it down and concentrating the sugars in it. The sap is very nutritious, lots of vitamins and minerals and amino acids. People use it for a variety of different uh, beverages. <clears throat> uh, the inner bark itself, so peel off the outer bark and go into the inner bark. It's going to be moist. 
before you get into the, it's basically the vascular cambium, the tissue that's active and growing and has the, the plant nutrients flowing through it. There's a sugar called xylitol. And I recently became aware of that and have been for several months now using a chewing gum to help dental health and oral health has xylitol in it because it kills the, the bad bacteria in the mouth that go after your, your enamel. <clears throat> so it just helps to maintain a, a good um, flora in your, in your mouth. One unique thing about the, the birch as well is that it's a very excellent fire starter, the, the bark. Even when it's wet, there's oils in it that allow it to start even when wet. The Native Americans used to make all kinds of various containers out of it, even all the way up to uh, fairly large boats. So you can eat the young leaves as they're just budding out. You can eat the inner bark. You can eat the young catkins. So the catkins are the, the portions that are hanging down. That uh, so, so a little bit like alder, <clears throat> the, the birch has a male and a female cone or catkin and cone. The cone is not really a cone. It's just a seed packet that once it gets mature, all the, the seeds just kind of flake off this one cylindrical, about the end of your pinky length um, structure. The catkins are very flexible pollen bearing structures found in the spring and those, those are edible. And then of course the buds are, are edible, the, the tree buds. On a small tree that could be fairly devastating but a large tree you're not gonna affect enough to strip the whole tree. <clears throat> so that would be, and one thing about the bark, which is at the bottom here is when you're harvesting the bark, don't harvest it from the main trunk because you could kill the tree that way. And you want to preserve the golden, the golden goose, right? So take the bark from lateral branches where you're not going to be devastating the whole tree by taking, taking the bark for use. So some medicinal usages, you can use the twigs, leaves, catkins, bark, buds, sap. So they all have um, anti-inflammatory properties, astringent properties, so they do tissue contraction again, diuretic properties, so that basically helps the kidneys to function and excretion of fluid. Has analgesic properties, so that's pain-killing properties. It has salicin in it. It's in the same family of, of things like willow and cottonwood that have the compound salicin in it, which is a derivative, is where aspirin was derived from originally. Functions in an anticoagulant role, <clears throat> so blood thinning in a way. And in the inner bark, it has a, a compound called betulin. So betulin is very beneficial. It has antiviral, anti-cancer, and antibacterial properties. And it particularly is helpful in humans in the form of betulinic acid. So you can um, extract that, but it's actually made by the chaga mushroom, which is a mushroom that grows into the tree you can see that black kind of scar on the surface of the tree. That's a chaga mushroom and it's exterior to the, the main growing area of the, of the tree. So it's deriving its nutrition from the saps and the inner bark of the tree. <clears throat> and it doesn't kill the tree, but it can be taken off and it actually makes betulinic acid, which is the, the active agent that benefits um, people in a variety of different ways. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on in more detail. So again, anti-inflammatory properties that are beneficial for joint pain, like arthritis, eczema, which is skin pain, essentially uh, muscle soreness. So you can boil the twigs, buds, and leaves to make a decoction or a tea. You can drink it or use it as a skin wash. So you can wash it over your uh, arthritic joint. The buds, you can do an oil infusion like we saw with the cottonwood bud. So use the, the olive oil to in, infuse the bud. So pack your jar full of buds and then with olive oil and do the, the infusion like we did with the cottonwood bud. Functions in a diuretic form, which is beneficial for heart, kidney, and, and fluid on the, on the legs, edema, fluid retention issues. Basically it helps reduce excess fluids and can help lower blood pressure in that regard functioning in a diuretic because it's lowering overall blood volume. And by doing that, you're lowering the overall uh, blood pressure. Also aids the kidney and it does that um, by allowing it to increase its filtration rate, i.e. passing fluids through it more quickly and creating um, a loss of fluid more rapidly. It can also help to lower uh, cholesterol and break up kidney stones, which is kind of interesting. <clears throat> 
beneficial in things like kidney infections, urinary tract infections, and cystitis. So the birch bark again has diuretic actions and it aids in basically flushing, flushing the body out by functioning with the kidney and uh, it's anti-inflammatory and antibacterial properties working in tandem. So it can be a stimulant for the digestive system. So you use a, a, a vinegar extract that can aid in stimulating digestion and it can function with anti-inflammatory properties. So beneficial for cramping like stomach cramps, uh, the gastrointestinal uh, calming, abdominal pain, bloating, diarrhea, it's all helpful for, for that. Uh, respiratory issues like coughs and congestion, the, the vinegar extract again can be helpful for that. So. You can add leaves to boiling waters and inhale them to, to relieve congestion. So the oils that are coming off of the, of the leaves can be, can be used. In fact, um, it's probably a little bit later on that talk about collecting the leaves. You wanna collect them in the morning because as the day wears on, the oils that are in the leaves that accumulate overnight, the heat causes them to escape into the air. So we've talked about the scent of the pine and the cedar being therapeutic. Um, Ellen White shared that. We know that forest bathing is beneficial from a immunological standpoint, increasing the activity of the, of the immune system to ward off uh, viral diseases and other types of diseases. So the, the oils of uh, birch also escape during the day as it warms up. So looking at a couple different recipes here, we have our uh, first one here is a, a, bar, a birch leaf oil and inner bark extract. Uh, so pack that jar three quarters full of fresh bark or leaves and then cover with an organic almond or olive oil. Cover the jar and place it in a sunny spot and steep it for, in the sun for six to eight weeks. So it's a pretty similar recipe to any other um, extraction it would become very common. So you're just using different things in them. So take that jar every other day or so, strain the solids after that time period and keep the oil. And always be sure you label your things. I've done this more than once. I've saved something and then didn't label it and get to the other end and don't really remember what it was. So be sure you label it and then cool and dark is the mantra for storing things. <clears throat> the vinegar extract, which is mentioned over here in the respiratory and digestive system uh, components, take crushed birch leaves into a jar. So any jar, you're just gonna go to three quarters of the volume of whatever jar you happen to have. And then cover that with apple cider vinegar. Stir it to release the air bubbles and make sure the vinegar fills it right up. Cap it tightly, um, soak it for four to six weeks and do again the alternate shake. Strain the solids and label it. So you can use this with meals. You can use it as a salad dressing. You can drink it, put it in some water and drink it at meals. Uh, <clears throat> so there's a variety of different ways that you can use that vinegar extract um, as an addendum to, uh, from a medicinal standpoint, as also kind of a food um, co uh, condiment. So various skin burns like frostbite or, or sunburns or even other types of burns, you can use the inner bark of the birch tree. So take it and mash it up into a pulp and apply that wet pulp to the damaged area and cover it with a clean cloth. cloth. So you can use a leaf or a bud poultice if the area happens to be infected in any way. So sometimes in, in dire situations with frostbite, you can wind up with gangrene. Um, if it's in a place where you have no access to medical help, hopefully where it's cold, birch trees often will grow there too and somewhere nearby. So immune system support, um, the birch leaves are, are helpful for uh, immune support, both anti-inflammatory and antibacterial. And they also provide a, a variety of minerals and vitamins, flavonoids and saponins that help in aiding the, the, the healing of the body. And then there's uh, research into the, again, into the chaga mushroom with betulinic acid that has been indicated as beneficial for, uh, for cancer. So again, the, the, for harvest time, the sap is harvested early in the spring. You have the buds and branches that open in the springtime. The inner bark is used, harvested in the spring or autumn and the leaves are summer. Again, here's the, the point talking about the oil is dissipating as the heat wears on in the day. So fresh is best, but dried can work if uh, you need them through the course of the winter. So not for pregnant or nursing mothers. Some people may be allergic to the birch family, it's possible. Some people are allergic to aspirin. So birch leaves can aid in sodium retention. So if you have a sodium retention issue, you wanna avoid that. Can be a blood pressure elevator in sensitive people. 
if they're allergic to it. And uh, don't use it if you're using other diuretics. And then also use lots of water when you're, um, when you're using birch. The next thing is actually looking at that mushroom, the chaga mushroom. It's the one that grows on the tree, on the birch tree. It's, uh, I think, specialized to the birch tree. But there's, it's best when used as a double extracted tincture. So it can be scaled down in uh, quantity by ratio. Uh, this was uh, a recipe, again, that's been used. Um, using alcohol extraction, but I threw in vegetable glycerin instead. Instead, it may not be quite as uh, um, quite as potent as an alcohol extraction, but just trying to move away from the alcohol. <clears throat> so you will need a, a half quart jar with a dried or sliced mushroom. Fill it to half inch at the top, and then put that glycerin in and stir it and cap it. And then for eight weeks, you want to uh, shake it every couple of days. Then strain and keep that glycerin that has done that extraction. And then you'll do the second extraction. So make a decoction of 16 ounces of distilled water. And you're using the same mushroom that you just pulled out of the other. You're gonna put that into the water. You're gonna simmer it on low till half the water is evaporated. You, need, you may need to add water uh, if your simmer isn't low enough, uh, but you should wind up with an eight ounce leftover remnant portion. Don't boil it, just simmer it. Then cool and strain the mushrooms and press them to remove any excess fluid. And then mix that with the glycerin extraction for approximately a 24 ounce total uh, volume. Basically a three to one ratio of alcohol to content if you're using alcohol. So the alcohol is shelf stable for many years. The glycerin typically has a, a shorter um, shelf life associated with it. So it's useful in all different types of cancers, including Hodgkin's disease. It prevents and treats via elevating antioxidant activity. Um, it can stop the growth of cancer and metastasis, and it can kill off cancerous cells, reducing tumor activity and aids in the body's elimination of cancer from the body. It's been noted as an adaptogen. Basically, that means that it can upregulate or downregulate as needed by the body. Uh, so it's immune, an immune modulator as opposed to an immune stimulant or an immune depressor. An immune modulant works for the body to put the immune system where it needs to be for any given time. So increased stress, it increases activity. Um, it's a, an overall tonic effect or, or, or health promoting effect. <clears throat> it also boosts um, <clears throat> the immune system in a couple different ways. It aids uh, through activating the immune system, but it reduces chronic inflammation systemically. <clears throat> it's beneficial for people with immune systems that are dysfunctional or that are weak. So that's good. Um, but the jury is still out on, on autoimmune conditions. So if you have an autoimmune issue, you may uh, be better off using the reishi mushroom extract as opposed to the chaga mushroom. But for, for cancers and other types of things um, that we've mentioned earlier, uh, the chaga mushroom is, is very helpful. So it's antiviral in nature. So it's a very excellent antiviral for uh, influenza, as well as herpes and, and HIV. The blood sugar control component of chaga is, is really quite fascinating. It can lower the blood sugar rapidly and significantly. So that could be helpful in a, in a uh, situation where you are not, you run out of your medicine or you're, you don't have access to, to it. But typically speaking, if someone's on a fairly restricted diet in living off the land, they're not gonna have a lot of sugar available to overdose, so to speak on sugar. Um, but it's nice to know that there are things out there that could be beneficial for that. So if you're taking blood, pressure, not blood pressure, but diabetic medication, make sure you're monitoring your blood sugar carefully when using chaga. So helpful in ulcerative colitis. <clears throat> so that's basically tears, ulcers in the colon, inflammation in the colon. And it's very helpful with its anti-inflammatory properties. So liver and hep hepatitis C age, so it should be liver, not live. Uh, so special predictive effects for uh, the liver. So aids, toxins, removal, and prevents hardening and scarring. Essentially, that would otherwise be known as cirrhosis, probably. It inhibits toxin formation that causes inflammation and helps fight the hepatitis C by activating the white blood cells and destroying any foreign material that might be present. And then finally, it functions as a fatigue reducer and helps increase endurance. Found this inner Interesting, helps those with low energy levels to increase energy. And it may increase endurance by actually lowering the lactate levels that are produced through muscle activity. So lactate is a byproduct of, of muscle activity that upon buildup 
uh, can cause muscle soreness and fatigue. <clears throat> when you're harvesting chaga, uh, remember that it takes these mushrooms a long time to grow. Only harvest if they're greater than six inches across, they can get to 16 inches. So let them mature to the right size. Leave enough mushroom in the tree so they can cover the opening and actually regrow and recover. And don't damage the tree itself. So they actually are growing out of the bark. Uh, so you don't want to go down into the, into the bark portion of the, of the mushroom. So only collect from living trees in an area that's environmentally clean. And you can collect them around the year, but fall time has the highest uh, bioactivity associated with it. So you will need a tool, a saw or hatchet to remove the mushroom and break it into smaller pieces and then remove any bark or tree bits that might be there if, uh, before you try it and store it. If you're gonna dehydrate it, use the lowest setting. And then once you've dehydrated it, you can use it, store it in a cool, dry place. So on the left, the bottom left there is a, an extraction process and process, a little muslin bag of storage um, tissue. And then you can actually purchase it. Like most herbs, you can purchase them or harvest it in different places, but five ounces is almost $25, so $22.50. <clears throat> so fairly, fairly pricey uh, material. So I can't say that I've ever actually seen a chaga mushroom, but I'm gonna to have to keep my eyes out and look for one. And they are probably present in our locality too, because I believe that they grow wherever there are birch trees.